on Facebook Live, we've got that phone turned sideways. Um, so, but it's saying that we can't turn it sideways. So you guys have to just turn sideways at your computer. So just tilt your head like this and all will be well if you can't, if you can't turn the monitor. Yeah, <laughs> turn, turn yourself on, right? Lock it and turn it. Um, okay, so in this workshop tonight, we're talking about vitamin A. And uh, this is one of those workshops where there's there's not a supplement that goes along with it. This isn't something that most people are going to go and supplement and you know add back into their diet. This is really truly all about diet uh, and what we're missing and why so many people are having this issue and, and how it touches on a number of different factors. So there's a lot of really fascinating information uh, in tonight, even in connection with things that you wouldn't necessarily connect. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, the first thing that we're going to talk about is retinol, okay? And this is not a commonly known form of vitamin A. Most people have, uh, have really never heard of it before. Most of the time when you look at supplements and you see vitamin A, it says what? It says beta carotene. And whenever you look up vitamin A, you're going to see pictures of carrots and sweet potatoes and yellow and green or yellow and orange vegetables, red vegetables, stuff like that because beta carotene is the plant-based vitamin A. It's a precursor vitamin A. But retinol is, is it's different. It's also known as vitamin A1. There are two sources of dietary vitamin A. There's the active forms, which are immediately available to the body. They're obtained from animal products. Okay, so if you're a vegan, vegetarian, you know, we, we are, you're really only getting the beta carotene. You're not getting retinol in your diet. Uh, these are known as retinoids and include retinaldehyde and retinol. Liver, store, liver cells store vitamin A as an ester, retinol incorporated into chylomicrons as an ester form, and when it's needed elsewhere, it's deesterified and released into the blood as the alcohol form. It then attaches to retinol, binding protein for transport around the body where it's shifted to where it needs to be. So what, what that says in short is that your liver stores your vitamin A. It's a fat-soluble vitamin. It stores what it needs, which means where's the highest concentration of vitamin A in your body? your liver, okay? And then when your body needs it, it releases that and sends it throughout the body to where it needs to go, okay? So that's different now from beta carotene. Beta carotene, it's uh, precursors also known as provitamins, which must be converted to active forms by the body. Uh, they're obtained from fruits and vegetables containing yellow, orange, and dark green pigments known as carotenoids. Okay, the most well-being, which is beta carotene. Okay, so this is what you see in all the supplemental forms. Now, while excessive amounts of vitamin A in supplement form can be toxic, the body will only convert as much vitamin A from beta carotene as it needs. Thus, beta carotene is a safe dietary source for vitamin A supplementation. This is why you see it typically as the supplemental form, because you can't really overdo it. It's kind of like the story with vitamin D. If you take just straight vitamin D, it's one of the four fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K. So when you take regular vitamin D, it can become liver toxic, okay? But if you take vitamin D3, it's very difficult to become liver toxic because it's already in the post-liver form, right? So your body doesn't have to deal with it. It doesn't have to process it. It uses what it needs and it can kick out the rest, okay? So this is one of those that is safe, you know, in its vegetable form. However, okay, when you look at beta carotene, one RE, which is a retinol equivalent, is 0 0.001 milligrams of retinol, or 0 0.006 milligrams of beta carotene, okay? So carotenoid, bioavailability ranges between one-fifth to one-tenth of retinols, okay? So what that means is you have to take five to ten times the amount of beta carotene to get the same as what you get in retinol, okay? So you can see if all you're depending on is beta carotene in your diet and you're not getting any retinol, you have to take five to ten times as much just to be at those safe levels. 
Okay, so moral of the story, it's good to have a little bit of a mix in there and make sure that you're getting both in there. Okay, now estimates have changed over time of the rate at which beta carotene is converted to vitamin A in the human body. An early estimate of 6 to 1 was revised 12 to 1, and from recent studies and experimental trials carried out in developing nations, it was revised again at 21 to 1. Okay, the implication of the reduced estimate is that larger quantities of beta carotene are needed to yield the necessary dietary requirements of vitamin A. Okay, so you need more beta carotene in order to get that minimum daily requirement because it's been adjusted lower and lower. This means that the more consonants uh, that that more consonants are affected by the deficiency deficiency of vitamin A than was previously thought. Changing dietary choices in Africa, Asia, and South America will not be sufficient, and agricultural practices on those continents will need to change. Okay, so when you look at, this is a, a map of basically uh, vitamin A deficiency, you see that the numbers in Europe, you know, in North America, which you can't really see from here, it's, it, they're in low percentages, very, very low percentages, because most people get it in their diet. You know, we have ready access to bell peppers and carrots and sweet potatoes and, you know, and, and meat products and dairy products, you know, uh, not always the right kind, which we'll cover, but we have ready access to a lot of these things. However, when you look predominantly in Africa and uh, the lower parts of Africa, Southeast Asia, you look at these different areas, a lot of their diet is things like rice, you know, and not very high amounts of vegetables and the things that actually have cover, uh, color to them. So you see the vitamin A deficiency rates going up. Okay, so that's what we want to investigate a little bit further. So vitamin A deficiency is a major public health problem in low and middle income countries, affecting 190 million children under five years of age. 190 million, that's crazy. I mean, think about that, 190 million children under the age of five and leading to many adverse health consequences, including death. Based on prior evidence and a previous version of this review, the World Health Organization has continued to recommend vitamin A supplementation for children aged six to 59 months, okay? So the World Health Organization is, is saying that everybody should be supplementing with vitamin A, all right? There is zero... I use international units of vitamin A in a cup of rice, zero, and only 3.64 IU in a cup of wheat, okay? So here in this country, you know, we don't necessarily, you know, our, our lower income households don't typically survive off of rice like they do in India and Asia and in uh, Africa, but, you know, it's, it tends to be more wheat-based products or, or even corn-based products. Corn is a little bit better. But we, you know, not so much. Population reference intake ranges from 1166 IU to 2000 IU for children, depending on the age. So they're supposed to be getting 1166 to 2000. But if they're getting a cup of rice a day, they're getting zero IUs of vitamin A. So what are the signs of deficiency with vitamin A? You've got dry skin, dry eyes night blindness and eventually leading to blindness, okay, because of, because of eye issues related and because vitamin A is required in the epithelial tissue repair and function. But in addition to that, it causes stunted growth. It causes stunted uh, bone development. So what do you see when you see malnourished children? You see very small frame, very, you know, small stature and everything. And you see all of these problems, you know, they, they and, and it's compounded, you know, it's not just vitamin A, it's all kinds of different compounded dietary, you know, uh, deficiency issues overlapping. But you can see why, because, you know, rice and wheat, they're not full of nutrients, okay? They're mass produced, uh, and, you know, you can't, no, no person can eat the same thing all the time and be healthy. Hence, look at people that around here that eat nothing but fried chicken. You know, I rip on that every workshop, I think, but, you know, pretty much, you know, some people, they live off of eating uh, the food, you know, every, every single day, you know, and you can't survive off of that stuff. You will end up with health problems and they vary depending on what you eat. 
But get this, the wholesale cost in the developing world is about two cents to 30 cents in US dollars per 50,000 units. So it's really not expensive to be supplementing, you know, and, and to really cover everybody. So, you know, the, the question is, how come we can have all of these uh, vaccination programs that are funded, but we're not funding vitamin A supplementation or the nutritional deficiencies that, like vitamin D that actually make a difference? You know, and, and the answers, you know, come pretty simple when you start looking at it. Okay, grain or grass. Pasture-fed steers incorporated significantly higher amounts of beta-carotene into muscle tissues as compared with grain-fed animals. So this was a study in 2005, and you can see from the chart here that grain-fed cows, they have very, very, very little amounts of beta-carotene within their tissues. But grass-fed, look at the difference here. Massive, massive difference. So how many of us, the big question here, how many of us eat predominantly grass-fed meats, right? And in this room, it's probably higher than average, right? But if we went into, uh, you know, the University of Alabama Stadium at the next game and we took, a, we took a roll call there in a stadium full of thousands of people, how many hands would you see? You would not be able to see them, most likely. Right, they would be drowned out in the crowd of crimson. Right, you just, you, <laughs> you you would not see any hands up, except for those that thought they were still cheering. Um, so you really want to make sure that your meat is grass fed. This is a dietary issue. This cannot be supplemented. Okay. What about uh, you know? Look at New Zealand researchers experimented taking cattle off pasture and fattening them American style on grain. So this is a very common practice, right? When you look for beef, you have to look for two things. You have to look for grass fed, but predominantly you have to look for grass finished because the common practice is that they put them in the fields and they raise them in the fields, but in the last phase, American style, they put them on grain because it can fatten them up by hundreds of pounds. Right? So what happens to your cell weight? Up, 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 right? So you make more money on the cows. So when you do that though, the serum levels of beta carotene drop a whopping 97% over the course of 48 days. Unbelievable. So a month and a half later, the nutritional deficit was massive, 97%. So what happens when we get off our diets? Look at it this way. It takes about a month and a half for us to lose our health where we're at. That means it's a daily struggle to make sure that we're eating the right things. Okay, what about great, uh, well, that should say grass or hay, not green or hay. Okay, so grass or hay, which, what is hay? It's just the dry grasses, right? So you wouldn't think there'd be that much difference because it's basically the same thing, right? This is stunning. Fresh pasture has higher levels of beta carotene than grass that has been harvested and turned into hay or silage. So if you look at the difference here in the beta carotene levels, this is the stored forage, hay. This is what you see in the fresh pasture. Unbelievable, the difference. So you don't only have to make sure that your beef is grass fed. You have to make sure that it's grass finished. Okay? You are what you eat. It's as simple as that. All right? What about other foods? Where do you find retinol in foods? Not just beta carotene, but where do you get retinol from? The main foods that you get retinol from is uh, yard eggs in the yolks of yard eggs. That's wild, free-range free range chickens, right? Uh, wild chickens. Do you guys have any wild chickens? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, free-range chickens. You've got it in grass-fed butter, okay? Grass-fed milk. That's why you know, I was saying uh, before, you know, go get your lattes tonight, you know, because you're gonna want to. Uh, which, by the way, Red Bar Espresso is just grass-fed, so there's not, there's not, there's no grain-fed milk there. Everything is grass-fed. Hence the, uh, the the plug there, the shameless plug. Um, so <clears throat> all of the dairy that we use in our store. We, everything is grass-fed, okay? Even the cheese is grass-fed. 
uh, the brand Kerry Gold is, is grass fed. So you want to stick to grass fed. And this is literally the difference between, I don't know if you can make out, I'm not gonna say the names of them uh, based on the labels here, but this is a grass fed butter that many people use. Okay, this is what, what one of the brands that we use at home. And this is the other a conventional store brand uh, that you see. Look at the color difference between those. I don't know if you guys can really appreciate this from, from the phones, uh, uh, you know, from the camera, but if, if you look at the difference here, you know, go back later and look at the workshop again online and you'll see the radical difference in the color. This is just so much more rich and yellow. This is like, uh, you know, something you paint your walls in. I mean, this would look nice in a bathroom, right? <laughs> so, um, I, in fact, I think our bathroom might be that color. Uh, <laughs> we'll just call it butter. butter. Yeah. <laughs> What's the color of your bathroom? It's butter. Um, okay, so uh, when you look at the amounts of retinol in foods, this is somewhat deceiving, and this is on purpose, okay? When you look at the daily values here, or the, the percentage uh, of retinol with the daily value, you know, 100 would be about right here, okay? So, you know, you look at these levels and they look pretty low for egg and butter and cheddar cheese. But that's deceiving just because I want you to see the dramatic difference in beef liver, okay? Where is the most retinol stored in your body? In the liver, okay? So naturally, you're gonna see tremendous quantities. It's actually 700% uh, of the daily value of retinol in a serving of, of beef liver. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of touch on that, how that applies. But if you were to look at other foods, if you were to look at rice, you would not see a graph here at all. If you were to look at most other things, you wouldn't even see it on the charts here. Because these foods, egg, butter, and cheese, okay, just dairy in general, and, and beef, you know, uh, also grass-fed beef, these are the things that, that you get the most amount in in your diet. So you want to make sure that you're consuming these things regularly. Uh, but, but if you're in a starving consequence, beef liver would be the best thing. Okay. Yeah. Let me touch on that real quick. You know, just in case you guys are looking to uh, run to the store real quick and buy a beef liver and, and eat the whole thing for dinner. Okay. You can overdo it on liver. Okay. This is, this is one you have to be very careful about. We were talking about this before the workshop. Um, there was a, one of the uh, examples that I looked at was uh, one of the earliest examples of somebody dying from, vet, uh, from vitamin A toxicity was a case in the Arctic where they got stranded and they ran out of food. And so they ate the sled dogs. And the guy who apparently ate all the liver, he ended up dying of vitamin A toxicity. Now, I don't know what's worse. I mean, starving and freezing to death or you know, a vitamin A toxicity, but you know, either way you can do it. That's the point, you know, so you don't want to just eat massive amounts of liver all the time. This, this is something that, that is potentially a good source though, when you know there is a deficiency present and you need to fill it fast. Okay. Now this takes an interesting turn in the workshop now, because uh, when you start looking into this, you see a, a really interesting connection here. And that connection is with measles, okay? We all talk about, you know, the, the you know, the, the, there's the vaccine debate and everything and the, you know, these infectious diseases that have been eradicated and everything else, you know, but we never really look at the details, right? We get just tidbits of information here and there, but this is just a stunning connection, okay? The overall integrity of skin and mucous membranes is maintained by vitamin A. We've talked about that, okay? It makes it, it, it it's what is responsible for repair of the epithelial tissues, you know, these, these mucous membranes. So especially the eyes, you know, is a big one that, that, that is always the first indication sign of a problem. You're going to see it in the eyes. Okay, so it creates a, a barrier to bacterial and viral infection. Okay, now vitamin A is involved in the regulation also of immune function by supporting the production and function of white blood cells. Okay, so another factor of immunity. Now, since vitamin A is therefore also required in regeneration of epithelial tissues, hence depletion with measles infection, because when you have an infection and you see lesions, your body is having to go and repair those. Okay, whether it's a, 
you know, whether it's a scrape or a cold sore or measles, doesn't matter what it is, your body is having to do repair and regeneration of epithelial tissue. And it takes vitamin A to be able to do that. So as it depletes the infection, it's mostly when it's not replenished, that measles becomes life-threatening. So the question of course becomes, was it really the measles that was causing the deaths or was it vitamin A deficiencies, okay? And when you look at this, this is just one of these classic examples that, you know, has been around, you know, and I, I was well aware of this a long time ago, but uh, you know, it's just really interesting when you look at this in correlation with it, because what has happened to our dietary standards from 1900 to the 1960s and our availability of food in different foods and grocery stores and everything? It's changed, right? We have a lot more access than we've ever had before, okay? And also the wealth of society has changed to where even lower income families can enjoy more variety that was not available before. But what you see in this chart is this is, this is the, uh, the amount of measles we see in the green here, okay? But we also see scarlet fever, typhoid, whooping cough, diphtheria, all these different diseases. You see these massive declines from the 1900s up till 1963, right? Available on this chart. Okay, but on the way, you see something interesting. Like here, here's a diphtheria vaccine introduced in 1920. You had all this undetermined slide before then. The, the antitoxin started use in 1894, and there was some slide there, you know, but here you've got whooping cough, you know, and it's following these same trend lines. Whooping cough was widespread use not until the late 1940s, okay? But the measles vaccine wasn't introduced until 1963. But look at what happened to those numbers all the way up until then, this huge slide with all the other infectious diseases, okay? And as I've shown in a workshop before, uh, there, were, there was another video of, a, um, I don't know, he was a foreign gentleman, that was talking, you guys might remember it, where it showed the, the, the timeline, he had the video timeline as wealth changed and what happened with the, with, the, uh, with the death rate, the average death rate, and with the age of the population. You guys remember seeing that? You might see, oh, here. I, I forget which workshop that was in, but it showed how it's a change in economics of a society as the economics of the society and the wealth of the nation increases, of course, the sanitation, changes and the availability of food and nutrition changes. And so as those things shift, the life expectancy radically increases. Okay, and they and it's very apparent when you look at all the data, you know, we had just tons of data mashed into this video. It's, it's, it's really a cool thing. But the point is, you look at this and you cannot say that the vaccine, that the measles vaccine was responsible for all this slide because it was slid well before. So what caused it? Right? And when you start looking at nutritional factors, that's when you start seeing answers. When you start looking at sanitation standards, that's when you start seeing the differences. Okay, now uh, we, we look further forward, measles blindness, okay? Measles is most common in countries of Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, and South Asia. Okay, did we talk about those before, right? That's where we see massive vitamin A deficiencies, okay? These areas together hold 85% of all blind children in the world. That is unbelievable, 85%. What causes blindness? Vitamin A deficiency. In these places, measles is endemic. According to a 2004 review paper by SEMBA, that paper found measles blindness accounted for anywhere from 15,000 to 60,000 cases of child blindness per year. Per year, okay? Vitamin A deficiency is common in developing countries, but rarely seen in developed countries, okay? Approximately 250,000 to 500,000 malnourished children in, in the developing world go blind each year from a deficiency of vitamin A. You see the stunning connection here, okay? So now you look at treatments 
Okay, here's the kind of signs that we see in the U.S. You know, Minnesota is experiencing a measles outbreak. Visitor restrictions are in place. No children allowed under five. No unvaccinated visitors and no sick visitors. Right? You know, because still the unvaccinated, of course, you know, are a danger to the vaccinated. How? I have no idea. I mean, if you're vaccinated and you're protected, then why would an unvaccinated person be a danger to you? But, you know, that debate rages on regardless. But see, low retinol levels, the median 0.70 micromoles per liter, were found in 72% of 114 children under six years old who had serologically confirmed measles during an outbreak in Wisconsin. That's here in the United States. Okay? 72%. 72% had low retinol levels. Okay? Hospitalized children had even lower levels. The median was 0.56 micromoles per liter, okay? But the illness severity was inversely associated with serum retinol concentration. So what that means is that the more <laughs> vitamin A, the more retinol deficient you were, the more your illness severity increases. Do you see why the connections are there, right? So. Uh, this was a study done in 1993 on measles severity and serum retinol concentration among children in the United States. So the points of conclusion here, there's a mounting body of evidence that viruses like exosomes are, and you need to look that up, this is a new wave in science, okay? Exosomes, basically, what it comes down to is viruses, you know, they're, they're they're like living, but they're not. You know, they're basically like little packages of information that aren't really alive, but they but they make adaptations within your body. Okay, well, they found these things called exosomes. That's a recent discovery that basically your body produces your cells. Every cell in your body, every single cell that they've looked at releases these things. And they're tiny, tiny, tiny vesicles that are filled with RNA data, okay? Basically, they're filled with information, okay? And your body is constantly, your cells are all constantly releasing these tiny little messengers all throughout the body, and they're received by other cells at distance and adapted accordingly. So this is like a new communication system in the body. So it used to be the nervous system only and, uh, and the hormone system now they understand that the cells send out these vesicles, the, these little tiny exosomes also. So it's one more transportation and communication vessel within the body. And it's eerily similar. And because of that, they become stronger and it's less likely that things get hacked, right? We can learn a lot from the computer world. It's funny how the two intermix. So not making these adaptations, uh, hang on. And like exosomes, they're a means of natural adaptation and building resistance of the organism, which is us, okay? Not making these adaptations has interesting correlations with future disease. For example, there was a study done that looked at men who had had both measles and mumps as a kid, and they found that they had radically reduced risks of having a heart attack later in life. How come? Interesting. But it was, it was a very significant difference in this study. So we see these things that as we've seen the infectious diseases go down, right, we've seen the rate of cancer and heart disease rapidly rise in its place. We've seen this, this I mean, it just looks like it's just crossed over, okay? So the question is, are we really doing right by trying to constantly fight against nature? Or, as I'm going to say here, instead of focusing on eradication of a few of thousands of viruses and bacteria, I mean, we call it the flu. You know, we got the flu, right? Do you know how many viruses, different viruses? Yeah. What, what is it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, right. the, do you know how many viruses act just like the flu? You know, they're talking about a universal flu vaccine. Why? Why is everybody on the hunt for a universal flu vaccine? I actually saw an article just now tonight about how they're looking at using llamas 
as the potential mechanism to be able to create a universal flu vaccine that they literally said llamas may have the answer you know because what happens every year when we look at flu vaccines what happens every year they find it's a massive failure last year is four percent this year is 13 percent the next year is seven percent but why would you go and get a shot full of mercury and a cocktail of all kinds of other things if it was going to be, if you were told on the front side that it was going to be 7% effective, we'll average it, 7% effective. And I have a whole workshop on the flu, you know, and, and the flu shots, you know, regarding that topic exactly. The, the answer is you wouldn't, you know, you would not, if you knew what was in it and you knew how little effective it was, you would get it. So they know this. They know that the public has a distrust of flu shots. I, every day I'm sitting in a room with patients and they're like, yeah, I don't like the flu shot. No, I don't. Like, no, I don't. No, I don't get it. No, I don't get it. I mean, they, they pat it and pat it and pat it in the media like, like, oh, you need to get it. And everybody's getting it and all that. No, everybody ain't getting it. <laughs> they're, they're not. They're, everybody ain't getting vac vaccines either. You know, it's, they're, they're suggesting that it's uh, somewhere between 35 and 40 percent of parents now are not getting their children fully vaccinated, okay? The levels are dropping because they're, you know, people are figuring this stuff out and they're, they're realizing what's really going on. But with the flu, they know they're in, they're in for it. They're going to lose the, uh, the, they're gonna lose the profits that they're generating if they don't get a universal flu vaccine. So they're searching for it, okay? But it's because there's so many other things that act like the flu and even so many strains of the flu that you can't keep up with at all, okay? So we can either continue to focus on eradication one by one of all these thousands of different things, or we can focus on the reduction of symptoms and what mechanisms like vitamin A deficiency in measles, C deficiency in Ebola. If you go back and you watch our Ebola workshop from, you guys remember Ebola, right? You know, when they, everybody was freaking out about Ebola, Okay, and that's not so, that's not a country. Yes. Uh, <laughs> like, Ebola. Uh, my God's Ebola. Uh, I can see that on the news right now. Um, but if you go back to that workshop, we pointed out at that time how it was not actually Ebola that was most likely killing people. That when you look at the symptoms of people dying from Ebola, they were bleeding from their eyes and their orifices, which is exactly what happens with scurvy. And when you find out what the treatment was over in Africa, they weren't treating them. They were just giving them massive amounts of Tylenol, which further depletes vitamin C. And so people are not dying from Ebola. They're dying from scurvy, vitamin C deficiency, the same thing that sailors used to die from on boats. Okay? So, you know, the smart thing to do would be to identify this and make sure that you're giving everybody vitamin C. That gets Ebola. They're getting vitamin C transfusions or liposomal vitamin C or, I don't, you know, it doesn't, and emergency, I, you know, whatever. Just give them some vitamin C so they don't die because when those people come back to the United States that got Ebola, you know, like the four of them or something like that, that, you know, they treated them here. You didn't hear about any of them die because they didn't. They all went into the hospital. They got, you know, they sat there for a couple of days eating a normal diet, got well, and might as well have been the flu or a cold, okay? But the same thing is going on with vitamin A deficiency in measles. These are really the cause and difference of effects from one person to another, how those symptoms express. So we shouldn't be focusing on eradication, you know, on mass global efforts in billions of dollars in order to make trillions of dollars. We shouldn't be focusing on that. We should be focusing on finding out what are the correlating deficiencies with these things? What are the real mechanisms that's going on underneath? And how do we strengthen and fortify people and educate people to where if they do get diagnosed with one of these things, how do you quickly resolve it? That should be the objective, right? Because now you don't have to worry about the developed countries, right? Because most of us aren't gonna have an issue so you go and you take those resources and you put them where they're needed and you give them vitamin A, you give them beef liver capsules or whatever you need to do to end the issue, okay? But making your immune system a fortress should always be priority number one. And since nutrients play a peculiar role in most 
we should be focusing really on our diets. That should be the key, you know, is really making sure that everybody is getting these things in their diet on a regular basis. For us, really all that means tonight is that, you know, we need to focus on, you know, the, the takeaway should be that you want to make sure that your dairy products are grass fed. You know, if you're, if, or whether you're drinking lattes every day or you're, you know, you only drink stuff at, at home, you know, and you're buying yogurt, Greek yogurt at home and stuff like that, make the switch and go to make sure that you demand and get nothing but grass fed because you're not getting it from the corn fed stuff. Okay. The other factor is, you know, make sure that you switch over to beef, you know, that that's grass finished, demand grass finished. Don't just look at a label quick. Some of the labels are really tricky. You know, they have a picture of grass on the cover, you know, but then you find out they don't feed, they don't eat grass at all. So why do you have grass on the cover? You know, and these are just little marketing tricks that the companies use to deceive. So you have to know where your sources are and make sure that you're getting the right stuff. So make those dietary changes and you really don't have to worry about it. Now, in the event that there is a measles outbreak, uh, not associated with Disneyland this time, but in our own backyard, you know, the second you find out about something like this, vitamin A, because guess what? The, uh, what, what the medical system is now saying is standard of care if you get diagnosed with vitamin A. Because it's all over the research. You look at PubMed and you go through and you read all the studies as I did. What do you see as standard product protocol if somebody, get, is somebody, if somebody is confirmed diagnosis of measles? They give them vitamin A. In the, in the hospitals, standard protocol now is to give them vitamin A because they know you're not gonna die if you get vitamin A. That's standard protocol now. So we have the answer, I mean, the, the, the information is there. I mean, how do we get the information, put it together and connect the dots? Because the information is there. We're just not looking at it. We're not looking for the connecting points, right? So if you know anybody at, at this point or any time in the future that has measles, vitamin A. Now, and, and they'll resolve no problem, okay? You guys have any questions before we wrap it up? If you guys have any questions online, uh, by all means, put them in the comments. You know, we'll, we'll try to get to those. Same thing on YouTube. Uh, if you like my pants or my belt tonight, make sure that you note that. Um, you know, I have to say that again. Oh, my shoes, yeah, here. here you, oh, you see my socks too? Yeah, I always get comments about, about my clothing that is completely irrelevant to the uh, workshop, so make sure that I poke fun at that. Um, you know, uh, so outside of that, if you have any questions, by all means, uh, ask away, we're here to help. And, you know, of course, all of this information is always about just making sure that people are getting the information to live better lives and that you don't fall victim to these just simple things that are just not, you know, that all of these things come because of changes in our diet. That's because of mass production or changes in farming practices or whatever, just misinformation because people are profiting off of it to do so. So if you pay attention and you eat, you know, you eat right and you eat wild and you eat uh, random, and I mean random real food, not, not random little Debbie's, you know, then, uh, then you're going to be better off, okay? So have a fantastic night, you know, and uh, you guys uh, ask away if you do end up having any questions. Uh, I feel like it. All right. Oh, I have one more slide. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Since we don't eat organ meat, then how do you get a liver supplement? Um, well, I actually, the reason why we don't carry. Remember, I was asking you about that liver one from mm -hmm. design, not bio proteins. Yeah, yeah. And the reason why I don't carry a liver supplement is because I can't verify that. I, I looked and I could not find oh, one that was verified as kosher. Yeah. You know, because by, by kosher standards, you're not supposed to have any blood in the organ. You're not supposed to consume blood, yeah. okay? Because it says in the Bible, don't consume blood. Um, so that's really difficult when, it's, when you're talking about liver, you know, an organ means